Owen Meany. I'm your host, Joe Nivering, and today we will take a look at a recap of Chapter 5, followed by rhetoric and thematic analyses. I'm glad you are here to join us for such an important chapter. Now to Rachel Recap to fill you in on the recent events. Thank you, Joe. At the middle of Chapter 5, Johnny, known as John in his later years, has trouble having a conversation with his reverend in Toronto. His name was Canon Mackey. John tries to carry on a conversation about war, while Cannon redirects the subject matter to focus on John's disappointment in the vestry elections and his lack of Canadian actions. And when Cannon brings up Christmas, John chooses not to introduce that miserable Christmas of 1953. But that is what Chapter 5 is all about. Owen has changed Graveson's Christmas performances. He has managed to have the most influential parts as a form of a prophet in both plays, without a single line. Owen is the best actor in A Christmas Carol, and he steals the show with his one scene. Owen has been getting very sick by the time Christmas comes around. On the day of the pageant, it is snowing, and Mr. Fish comes to see Owen, even though he has never been to a church. The Merrills, the Congressionalist, Ministers are also at the pageant as a trade-off with the Wiggins, the Episcopalians, who will be going to the Vesper service in exchange. Everyone obeys Owen. During the nativity, Owen takes control. He orders Barb around to get his swaddling perfect. He gives the angel his lines when he forgot. He orders his parents to leave when he sees them in the audience. He forces Mary to act a certain way. He commands Joseph to take him out of the church, and when people do something to take away his control, like when Barb kisses him, he becomes angry. When he sees his parents, he is furious and screams at them from the manger to leave the church for their sacrilege. The end of the nativity brings confusion and chaos. Mr. Fish, it having been his first nativity, thinks the plot was great and got the point across very well that Jesus was never a normal baby. He compliments Owen's character. Meanwhile, Barb Wiggin is furious and wants to speak with Owen before he even enters the church again. But through her fury, she forgets Harold Crosby in the angel harness. Dan finds him, thank goodness, lowers him, and speaks to Barb about her negligence and that she does not have the authority to prohibit someone from church. When Christmas Eve comes around, Dan and Johnny try their best to stay busy as a way to avoid Tabby's absence. At the final production of A Christmas Carol, Owen is very sick and is still not providing an explanation for his behavior at the Christmas pageant. At the show, Johnny observes the crowd with hopes of finding the face to which his mother had waved at the baseball game before her death. Of the faces, he sees the Merrills, who are at the production with their rambunctious children. Mr. Morrison is also there, seeing what could have been had he been in the show. Johnny focuses on the Dwellings, though, and their sexual opposites. As the ghost of Christmas yet to come, Owen faints and scares himself off stage, saying he saw his name on the grave. He is feverish and is rushed home. When Johnny returns home, he finds out from Germain that Lydia has died in her sleep. The argument sprouts within the family if Owen's vision was a foreshadowing of Lydia's death. But this goes unresolved. Jermaine sleeps in Johnny's room that night, and Johnny has unusual sexual feelings that he believes have come from his father. He feels it as an evil. Johnny calls Owen, who agrees and supports him with all his opinions and experiences from that evening, except that he does not believe Owen saw his name correctly on the grave. Owen confidently responds that he saw his full name, but no date so he says. Will we learn that what the date should have been and might have been written on the gravestone in Gravesend? See you next time. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Rachel. I hope we never learn that date. With the death in the air, we will advance to Rebecca Rhetoric for a deeper look at one of Ivering's similes. Now to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Joe. I'm nervous to bring to your attention some of Ivering's possible foreshadowings of Owen's death. I know, I know, it would be awful, but this could be Ivering's way of preparing us. So, let's take a look at page 230. 
I will never forget the inflamed color of his bare skin in the winter cold and the hospital white on white of his swaddling clothes against the new snow, a vision of the little Lord Jesus as a born victim, born raw, born bandaged, born angry and accusing, and wrapped so tightly that he could not bend at the knees at all and had to lie in his parents' laps as stiffly as someone who, mortally wounded, lies upon a stretcher. Wow! Even if we didn't catch the presence of death from the first few clauses, Ivring hands it to us by describing Owen as mortally wounded. Ivring uses this image to capture the graveness, pardon my pun, of the moment. Not only is Owen burdened by his sickness, but also by his anger and his entrapment in what should have been the holy clothes of the Lord Jesus. Ivring describes him as a victim who has been mortally wounded, a wound he will never recover from and will cause death. It leads us, the readers, to question the cause of the wound. Is it Owen's physical size or his illness or is it spiritual? The relationship between him and his parents or between him and God broken? The answer to the question is hidden within the passage. The statement that Owen could not bend at the knees means that he could not kneel to pray, to worship God, but instead was trapped in the arms of his earthly parents. From this, we receive an understanding that Owen's parents stifle his spiritual being. This is also a likely explanation for Owen's expelling his parents from the church as a sacrilege. From this, we say a prayer for Owen Meany that this suffocation from God will not be his end, though it appears that it may be too late. That's all for this section, but don't forget to read deep between the lines of Owen Meany. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Rebecca. I am alarmed by the likelihood of Owen's imminent death, but we will now go to Teresa Themes for a look at John's Canadian perspective of America. Thanks, Joe. John Ivern uses his character, John, what a coincidence, to criticize the average American for their isolated perspectives. As a current Canadian, but past American, John has had personal experience of the transformation that occurs when one looks at America from the outside. He points out that Americans are ignorant to other cultures and don't even recognize their own culture. A prominent theme is determining this American identity. Earlier, Johnny mentioned the importance of baseball in American culture, but stresses in the plot line the negatives associated with baseball. Now he emphasizes that the American identity can't even be determined by an American because they are lacking a cultural comparison and refuse to look at matters from another's perspective. Ivering is really giving Americans a hard hit. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Teresa. That wraps it up for this episode. Check back next week to hear... The Voice.